Ben, I'll tell you, Mom, Dad, I couldn't get that passed. But what I did do by executive order, I made sure every federal agent, every federal agent mm -hmm. has to abide by mm -hmm. that act. Mm -hmm. And so, well, that's but, a start. Uh, we got to get it for local police. The head of the Welsh Rugby Union has resigned amid allegations of a toxic culture within the governing body. His decision comes after the WRU announced an external task force will investigate claims of misogyny, sexism, racism and homophobia within the institution. Former Wales winger Nigel Walker has become acting CEO for the time being and has warned of an existential crisis for Welsh rugby ahead of the Six Nations. You're up to date on GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Sunday with Michael Portillo. Uh, thank you, Bethany. It's described as a serious breach of the ministerial code and it gave Prime Minister Rishi Sunak clear grounds to dismiss Nadim Zahawi from the government. Zahawi's response contains no apology or contrition. The Prime Minister has been criticised for not acting sooner. He also now has to deal with multiple allegations of bullying by Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab. If that leads to a dismissal too, that would constitute a second savage wound to Rishi's government, which is just 100 days old. And what of the fate of the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case? As evidently he didn't know about Nadim Zahawi's tax affairs, is it time for him to walk the plank too? I'm joined now by William Ragg, MP, who's on the executive of the party's powerful 1922 committee, Alan Evans, who was once my private secretary when I was a minister before rising much higher in the civil service, and GB News political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Uh, will, will there be a sense of relief on the back benches that this dismissal has occurred? Well, I think there was a certain inevitability about it after a week in politics as uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg mentioned earlier, but I also think it was quite right and proper that the Prime Minister first of all appointed an independent advisor in Sir Laurie Magnus and that he was charged with investigating it properly and thoroughly. Now, that's um, interesting because I would have... I mean, it seemed to me from the language that the Prime Minister was using in the House of Commons last week that he pretty much decided to sack Zahawi because he was talking of him as the Minister, not my uh, uh, right honourable friend. And since he obviously hadn't told the Prime Minister things that I think the Prime Minister was mm -hmm. entitled to know, he might have used that as a reason to get rid of him, saying, well, you know, whatever the facts of this, you should have told me there was this issue. That may well have been the case. And I think in terms of the appointment of a minister and any flag that is raised by HMRC uh, to the Prime Minister, uh, the nature of that um, issue isn't shared any further because the tax matters remain private. Now, if that matter had been resolved in a previous administration early in the summer, then the Prime Minister would have no reason uh, to have been alerted to it unless that information had been volunteered. Mm. Maybe Prime Ministers don't do this as assiduously as they should, but they perhaps should be asking, is there any reason why I should not appoint you? Is there anything that might embarrass me? This is, by the way, a question we were always asked when we were applying to be members of Parliament. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you were mm -hmm. asked this, but I was asked, you know, is there a skeleton in your cupboard? Well, I think those are, are, are questions that require the person to uh, answer thoroughly and uh, honest, honestly. Um, you know, I was, wasn't there to, uh, to, to hear that question being asked. I think Michael Gove spoke earlier this morning about having windows into men's souls and so forth. But uh, it, you raise a very valid point, Michael. What about Dominic Raab? Um, you, you were talking earlier about, you know, things being eked out over a period of time and mm. doing damage to the party and the government. Heavens, the Dominic Raab thing has been eked out over a very long period. Oh, it has, and I think you know, the, the press coverage continues to, to grow on that. Um, and interestingly, in the rather febrile state of politics, the investigation engagement being conducted, commissioned by the Prime Minister, was done at a time when there wasn't an independent advisor uh, to appoint to investigate. But uh, without sounding uh, stereotypically political, Michael, it would be best for that uh, investigation to finish before any judgments are, are drawn. And you backbenchers will be happy with that, will you? Because this could go on a long time. I think we have to be. That's, that's the process. We're, we're not um, in the position to know of the, of the veracity of allegations and, and, and press speculation. It has to be done um, as objectively as possible and for those uh, findings to be uh, revealed. Uh, Tom, we're hearing here that a Prime Minister is in a bind because 
you know, the political reality is that Nadim Zahawi had to go. Everybody knew that, including the Prime Minister. But he was bound by his idea of natural justice to continue with this process until today. Yes, and it became very difficult for the Prime Minister to stick by this line, which I suppose you can, you can make a very solid argument for, that you shouldn't prejudge the outcome of any investigation, that, pro that due process must take place, that people are innocent until they are proven guilty in this country. That's something that clearly the Prime Minister believes in, and yet the pressure around this issue became so uh, great that it became... It, it sounded like it was a bit of a get-out, that this was simply a delay tactic, something to kick the can down the road. I wonder how much political pressure had been placed upon the independent advisor on ministerial standards, Sir Logri Magnus. How much <coughs> pressure has been placed on him to get this done very, very quickly? Because this is so much faster than any investigation we have seen before. The Pretty Patel investigation under a previous advisor took many, many months. Of course, the Sue Gray investigation <laughs> took about half of my lifetime. Um, we have seen these sorts of investigations go on and on and on. The investigation into Dominic Raab was started at the start of December. That's still going on to this point. So for this investigation to be concluded in less than a week is really quite unusual. What is your assessment of the damage to the government of this? I think the government has already been damaged significantly. We haven't seen the polls shift, particularly on the back of this issue. What this issue may have done is embed a feeling that was already there amongst the British public. We can see the Tory party are about, on average, 20 points behind the Labour Party in the polls. That has not shifted. The appointment of Rishi Sunak to the position of Prime Minister has not moved the needle in this area, something that perhaps Conservative MPs thought it might. But clearly, the, as long as these sort of scandals drag on, the issues with the brand of the Conservative Party remain. There are different qualities to some of these um, scandals. I mean, I believe that focus groups have revealed that whereas people are pretty relaxed about the Richard Sharp business, to the extent maybe that they understand it, mm. that they were definitely not relaxed. They could perfectly understand that they thought Nadim Zahawi had not paid taxes, has not mm. been straightforward about the taxes that he paid and the penalty he paid, mm. and they were very indignant about that. So there, there's a different quality to different scandals. There certainly is, and crucially, the public interpretation of the scandal is often slightly different from the scandal itself. Uh, reading through very quickly the report that was published this morning from uh, Sir Laurie Magnus, it's clear the breaches of the ministerial code aren't to do with paying that penalty. The breaches of the ministerial code are about not disclosing having paid that penalty at the various stages, being appointed a minister under Liz Truss, being appointed a minister under Rishi Sunak, and indeed uh, declaring on just your register of interests in general what was going on and, and responding to questions about whether or not there was an investigation by HMRC. These were the points that broke the ministerial code. These were the points of non-disclosure <coughs> rather than the fact of having paid a penalty in and of itself. Let's talk about disclosure with uh, Alan Evans. Um, it seems that um, Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, would now be arguing that he didn't know about Nadim Zahawi's tax affairs. Do you believe that he should have done? Are you surprised that a Cabinet Secretary didn't know about this skeleton in the cupboard? I think it's important to remember that the ministerial code, which is the Bible governing the way in which ministers should behave, puts the onus very much on the minister to declare things. And it's interesting what Tom said there about the fact is that the Harwi clearly did not declare that there was a, a breach of um, uh, the ministerial code or potential breach of the ministerial code because of the conflict of interest with his financial affairs and being investigated by HMRC. And the code is also very specific, saying even a potential uh, conflict of even interest... Even the appearance, I believe. The appearance of a... Oh, you corrected me on the detail of the code. Well done. Even the appearance. So the onus is actually on, in this case, Nadine Zahawi, not on Simon Case to do investigations. So I think it's hard to criticise the Cabinet Secretary when, as uh, the report from Sir Laurie Magnus makes clear, it was Nadine Zahawi who did not make these declarations. I thought it was, um, Alan, curiously coincidental that today there is a revelation of a minute, I think, back from December 2020, which tells us that the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, sent a warning to Boris Johnson that he should not anymore talk to Richard Sharp, mm -hmm. who was to become the BBC chairman, about his own financial affairs. Were you struck by the timing of this revelation? Remarkable coincidence, I would have thought, yes. But again, looking back to the role of the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, he was being criticised some days ago for not having given proper advice and guidance to the Prime Minister to tell him he shouldn't be talking to Richard Sharp. It now appears from the 
coincidental leak of this um, uh, minute to the Sunday Times that a long time ago he did give very strict advice saying you should not take advice from the um, uh, potential chair of the uh, BBC. Now, I noticed also in the Sunday Time piece that at the end, Boris Johnson, or a spokesperson for him, says at no time did he ever discuss his financial affairs or seek advice from uh, Richard Sharp. So that is diametrically opposed to what Simon Case said in the advice which has been mm. leaked. Now, I can't believe that Simon Case, who is a busy man, goes around putting up uh, notes about don't discuss your financial affairs with Richard Sharp unless that has taken place. So, uh, on the one hand, that's what Simon Case says. On the other hand, uh, Boris Johnson says it didn't happen. Now, uh, Mr Johnson is something of a stranger to, the stranger to the truth we've seen. So, I know who I believe in that situation. Well, steady on, old man. But, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, thinking uh, about Simon Case, uh, he, he did have a pretty chequered history during Partygate. At one time, he was going to investigate Partygate before it turned out that his office had been organising parties. I just wonder, I mean, if, you know, even if it's not very just, whether his, whether his luck hasn't run out. Well, if you look what he's achieved, he's been Cabinet Secretary for less than three years. In that time, he's had three Prime Ministers, all of the issues that you've talked about, including Partygate. He's overseen extremely effectively, as far as I can see, the death of the Queen and the accession of the King. He's got the coronation to look forward to. This is an enormous agenda for Simon Case. Now, at some stage, no doubt he will move on. He was appointed aged 41, 42. Most people, when they're appointed Cabinet Secretary, it's the end of their career, unless he continues to do this job for 18 years. I suspect at some stage he'll move on, but I think he's got a good track record over a turbulent political time. And enough that robust defence. We'll look out for your uh, coming knighthood, I, I think. Mm. Now, Will, what... <laughs> Have you any thoughts about who ought to be the party chairman? Should we, should we say a word, first of all, about what party chairman is? I mean, I think of it as <coughs> organising mm. um, election strategy, yeah. uh, rousing up yeah. the membership yeah. and being part of the public face of the campaign Indeed. alongside the prime minister. Yeah. Those would be the three main elements. And, and, and drawing a good raffle, of course, at any, <laughs> any, any party function. I think that's one of the, the, the key uh, aspects I would judge them on. Uh, and in that, I think we've probably got a, a wealth of talent, but... Uh, even with that wealth of talent, alighting upon a name for me so soon uh, is a struggle. Um, but well, that, that... I thought of Grant Shapps. Mm -hmm. I mean, Grant Shapps uh, is uh, he's a numbers man, isn't he? He, he? he knows a lot about political trends. He's very interested in polls. Mm. He's, he's very good at tracking people. He's a bit of a strategist, therefore... Pretty popular with the membership. But we wouldn't want to deprive him from as a, as a, as a Secretary of State in a, in a, in a department. So this is always going to be the, the difficulty, uh, any uh, forced mini reshuffle that, that occurs. Uh, you're wanting to keep the people who you uh, presume are, are talented in, in certain departments and you're on the lookout. Do you want to bring a, a safe pair of hands or do you want somebody who, who might be uh, uh, willing to have a, a throw of the dice, perhaps, in their, their approach as, as party chairman? Is it as important as it used to be? When Cecil Parkinson was the party chairman, it was really thought to be Norman Tebbit too, really mm. critical position. I wonder whether it has the importance that it used to? It should be, and it should be a, a parliamentarian who does the role, in my view, on their own. We should, we should get away from this, this model of, of co-chair that seems to have uh, crept in and it's almost given as a sort of, you know, a consolation prize for somebody who would like to be on the sort of the, the extended bit of the cabinet table at any particular time. So I think if we can find somebody of suitable status and make sure that they're invested with the proper authority, that would be the way to go. Um, Tom, one last thought. I was very struck by Sir Harwi's letter of mm. a response. There's not a reference to the cause of his leaving. There's not a word of apology or contrition. And, and why, why might there be? Well, because he might have been frank with the Prime Minister. He has caused immense embarrassment to the party and government, whatever may be the background to this issue. Are you surprised that there was no word of apology there? I think it's clear that he feels rather hard done by. He points to two big achievements, as he sees it, in his time of government, the, the vaccine rollout and, uh, and then, of course, as uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, helping to oversee uh, the funeral and the logistics of the queue to see uh, to pass by the Queen lying in state as well. Um, and then, interestingly, the letter goes on to talk about how the fourth estate have behaved in recent weeks. Uh, and for people who don't know that what the fourth estate is, it's people like you. It is. It's the media. And, and, and criticising the media explicitly uh, in the way in which they have gone about reporting this stuff, particularly pointing to a headline in The Independent uh, in recent days, which, said, which read, 
Zahawi the Noose Titans. And I think Nadim Zahawi felt particularly uh, vulnerable, really, at some of this reporting. He spoke about how it affected him and his family. Uh, and he wanted to make a note of that very, very clearly in his resignation letter. Perhaps it wasn't the right time to do so. It certainly hasn't landed well. And if there's uh, sort of one group that you really don't want to uh, make an enemy of as you exit a position of influence, it's the media. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg a moment ago rather also took the line that he thought uh, Zahawi had been a, a bit hard done by. Yes, it's interesting because he is a popular individual within the Conservative Party. It's one of the reasons he was, of course, appointed party chairman by Rishi Sunak in the first place. This is a guy with an incredible backstory who came to this country not speaking a word of English, who fled persecution from Saddam Hussein, built an incredibly successful business from scratch, and then reached sort of the heights of Chancellor of the Exchequer and various other positions within the cabinet. It's the most remarkable British success story. And to that extent, I think many of his colleagues feel a, a sense of sadness that it's come to this. Absolutely. And that was reflected, by the way, in the Prime Minister's letter to him. Um, many thanks indeed to Alan Evans and Tom Harwood. I'm going to ask uh, William Rag MP to stay with me to discuss after the break how, a hundred years after its foundation, the Tory party's powerful 1922 committee is still deposing and creating Prime Ministers after the break. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit. Well, off you are. You, 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 no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone. I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. To have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Do you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us. Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back. With three Prime Ministers last year was tumultuous for the Conservative Party. 
At the heart of events was the 1922 Committee of Backbenchers, which seemingly perversely is celebrating its centenary this year. Well, in 1922, Tory backbenchers meeting at London's Carlton Club brought down the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. Since then, the name 1922 Committee is enough to send a shudder down any leader's spine. Those elected in the 1922 election formed a committee early in the following year, which is why the 1922 is 100 in 2023. Simples. William Ragg is on its executive. So I hope I got the history uh, more or less right or less. there. Um, now, I know that uh, it's not called 22 because it brought down the Prime Minister. It was the people who were elected in 22. They formed it in uh, 23. And you will be celebrating the centenary. It's had a remarkable last year, and you've been on the executive. Yeah. What are your reflections on the role that the 22 played last year? I think my reflections, it, it confirms my opinion that the 1922 committee is a sort of uh, release valve um, within the Conservative Party. Um, and while pressure uh, can take a, a greater or lesser uh, length of time to, to build up behind that valve, uh, when that valve is opened, it, it, it relieves that pressure um, and, uh, and, and brings about um, a change. It's important, really, to, to note, it's not the committee itself that you know, decides, gets up in the morning and decides, well, what we're going to do today, we're going to change the Prime Minister. Uh, as I say, it can be um, a, a long or short time coming in, in this sort of um, groundswell of the view of colleagues uh, as to what, sh what should change and what should happen. Uh, being a member of the executive, so the sort of management board, uh, do you take the view that you're there to reflect what the mass membership of members of parliament is saying, or are you there to have your own positions as well? We're there to reflect the, the view of the, of the party at large. They are the ones... Uh, of of colleagues, rather, of backbench colleagues. They're the ones who elect us um, to the positions through internal election, uh, and therefore we reflect, reflect the view. Most of the time, our work would be described as, as being fairly uh, dull. Uh, each week, we will meet, uh, we'll meet as an executive and we'll discuss um, the issues that are affecting uh, members of parliament and their, their views and internally, and we'll make representations of them to ministers, to the prime minister, uh, on a weekly occasion, occurrence, occurrence of the chief whip um, as well. So we're very much... Uh, a sort of uh, shop stewards uh, of the parliamentary party. How scientifically do you sample the opinion of the party? When I, when I was a party whip, we mm. each had a flock. Yeah. So we had, you know, 20 members that we were responsible for, for talking to on a regular basis. Does the executive have that sort of procedure? Were you responsible for a particular number of members? Not formally, but we certainly are, are, are drawn from a wide spectrum within the backbench party and therefore have... Uh, different networks and to take different different soundings. Uh, it, it's not as scientific as, as you described there, having the, the par parliamentary party neatly divided, um, but it, it, it seems to uh, have a have more of an or organic quality to it. Mm. So, I mean, you, you went through extraordinary events uh, last year. Um, is there anything? I mean, could anything ever have been any different? Um, when, it's hard when, to... when was Boris's fate sealed? My personal view, sadly, is that that came or b began with the uh, vote on our former colleague Owen Paterson yeah. um, and the uh, attempts to, uh, to, to change the, the, the process of that report. I, I think that for many people... This is a member of parliament yeah. who had been criticised for uh, outside interests. Yeah, and I think that the, 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 the trying to change the procedure around that at the time... Uh, I think uh, many will admit, including the, the former Prime Minister himself, that that was the wrong course of action to have taken. And I think that is where uh, the, the real, real issues started. And on the second deposition of the year, I mean, you could never have imagined, could you, that a Prime Minister would come and go in 45 days? No. And tell me about the role of the 22 in the Liz Trust case. I think that was much more quick-moving uh, than it was. Uh, and I think that came... Um, it, whilst the party was still in a, a degree of internal flux anyway, a very febrile um, time, and I think it, largely in reaction to the, uh, the, the budget um, of, that, of that month uh, and the consequences of it uh, and, and, and the, the general mood that that created within the parliamentary party. That brief period of Liz Truss government, I would say, I hope I'm saying this kind of as neutrally mm. as I can, as, as an objective uh, observer, it has done tremendous damage to the Conservative Party. I mean, it absolutely limited the possibilities, the freedom for action 
of Rishi Sunak and his government? I think the consequences, uh, the, the financial consequences of that um, budget uh, have been profound and have, uh, and have now really everything that we're about economically, at least in the, the, the short term, have been in, in addressing the, the, some of those issues and really limiting the, the room for manoeuvre, um, meaning that there are, quotes more uh, tough decisions to be made than might have been the case. You will not be a candidate in the next election. You've decided uh, not to stand. Mm. But as you reflect on the massive gap between the Conservatives and the Labour Party in the opinion polls now, and compare it with the much smaller gap that existed when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, would you say objectively, as an observer, that the Conservative Party has done a sensible thing in swapping Boris Johnson eventually for Rishi Sunak? My personal view is, is yes. And I think where you have to look at where those polls changed, particularly came, as we just mentioned, um, after that, that budget um, in, the, in, in the early autumn. Uh, so the, the, the question being the economy stupid, really, if we borrow that from um, Clinton's campaign in the States. Um, I think that is, that is where the real shift in the polls occurred. Uh, now, you might think me a, a raving lunatic, but I would, I would still... Um, uh, suggest that there will be a, 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 albeit smaller, Conservative majority at the next election. That is my, my, ge my general view, uh, is that the Conservatives will be well placed um, that, to win the next election. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm slightly surprised by your prediction, but let me, let me ask you, based on your prediction, mm. would the majority have been bigger had Boris remained? I don't think so. I think, it was, I think it's very different and difficult to understand, but you know, it's easy with hindsight to reflect on that. But also, I think in, in so doing, we reflect, uh, we forget about some of the issues and the difficulties we were facing as a parliamentary party at that time. I think the real shift in the opinion polls came uh, with the, uh, the budget uh, in the autumn. Is it nasty being a member of parliament? Why are you leaving? Is it an unpleasant existence? It isn't always a pleasant experience, if I can turn the question slightly around uh, uh, in that way. Uh, but personally, I, I found it, it would have been nine years, and at the grand age of 36, I will uh, retire, as it were, from parliament, hopefully not entirely institutionalised and de-skilled, but able to go and, and, and make a useful contribution to the world. Um, I think the days of you know, decades-long uh, parliamentary service may well be behind us, and we should rather view politics in a, in a different way, in a more healthy way, that people will, will, will come and go. Um, but for what, me... What, what are the things that make the parliamentary life not pleasant? I think it's difficult when you're juggling various um, demands. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if, 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 for example, you have a family, you're spending a great deal of time away from them, but that was ever so. Um, I think sometimes the way that uh, MPs will behave towards one another uh, leaves a little bit to, uh, to be desired. Um, but uh, I think overall, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great thing to, to do and to be involved with. Uh, but it, it, you'd be foolish for thinking it didn't come with it, without its challenges. Were you, were you surprised by some of the others who are standing down? Deanna Davison, uh, Sajid Javid? I'm not surprised, because I, I, I th I'm in that same situation whereby you reflect more widely um, on life and what you, what you wish to be doing with it. And people won't believe you, because they always assume it's on the basis that you're sort of fleeing before you're uh, dispatched by the electorate. But actually making a, a, a positive decision, taking ownership of a situation, um, I think is, is a very healthy thing and a very positive thing for individuals to do. And, um, and what about the pull of duty? Because mm. I would have said that you stood the best possible chance of holding your seat for the Conservatives. I would have said that Deanna Davidson stood the best possible chance of holding Bishop Auckland for the Conservatives. Mm. Did, did, you, did the two of you, well, you might not know her mind, but yep. did it go through your mind? Oh, yes, always, because, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I represent my hometown. You know, I've never stood for election anywhere else. I never even went for selection as a candidate uh, anywhere else. I was previously on, on the local council. It's where I you know, grew up and where I live. And having won three general elections there since 2015, of course, uh, there's a there's huge uh, uh, weight of expectation and indeed a sense of duty within me to continue to serve it, which I'll I, I do until the next election. But I think when you, you, you begin to balance that more fully, um, that you realise that making a decision isn't always about selfishness. It, it, it can just be the, the best time and, uh, you know, that you, you can uh, leave the stage. William Ragg, I think the House of Commons will miss you. It's been a great pleasure to have you on GB News. And in the coming week, you will be celebrating the... Well, the coming days, you'll be yep. celebrating 
the centenary of the 1922 committee. Uh, many thanks indeed to William Rag from the executive of the 1922. Coming up, are suits and ties just for estate agents and bankers? I don't think so. But after the break, we'll talk to someone who does believe exactly that. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this Even morning. I even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Oh, you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Do, why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8 p.m. Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit well, on. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree, that's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yeah. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The pandemic changed many things, including, it seems, the way that we dress. Well, some of us. Uh, virtual working meant less formality and more sportswear. As some people have crept back to the office, they've maintained Zoom wear with smart clothes consigned to the back of the wardrobe. Now, one UK law firm declares that the traditional shirt and tie are, quotes, the domain of bankers and estate agents only. It wants its staff to dress elegantly to reflect their personality. Aisha Vardag, the founder of the divorce and family law firm Vardags and uh, author of the new dress code, joins me now. Hello, welcome to GB News. Hi, Michael. Very, very pleased to meet you. Why, why have you issued this new dress code? What is it you want to get away from and get towards? So it wasn't suits and ties the domain of bankers and estate agents only. It is that increasingly it is that way. And it's no longer a requirement in order to be elegantly dressed to adopt that particular sartorial style. What I want to get people to is just a sense of being very elegant without having to conform to a particular sort of conformed dress code in that way. I want them to be able to express their own individuality more. And it's the opposite of coming back to work in hoodies and tracksuits and lockdown wear. It's about making coming to work a bit more of an occasion with more of a sort of party special occasion feeling because that's, that's integral to getting people wanting to be in the office and wanting to have that special experience of being together and that meaning more than just being at home in their sitting rooms. All righty, let's, uh, let's look into that. What is your definition of elegant? How could you imagine, for example, a man dressing to meet your description of elegant? Michael, I would say that today you are extremely elegant. I would be very happy to see any of my lawyers come in dressed as you are today. <laughs> OK, I, I, I didn't mean to feed you that line, but wait a minute. I'm wearing a shirt. I, I'm wearing a shirt and tie. I thought that was part of what you were against. 
You are, but it's expressive. In fact, you're actually colour coordinated with me, so how could I not like it? But uh, but you know, I, I'm happy for people. You know, if you if what you were wearing, as I put in my memo, was in fact uh, an electric blue sequined jacket and gold leather trousers, that would be fine too. If that was how you wanted to express yourself, and it you know, and it made you look good and feel good. I've been very clear, I don't want to reduce the gravitas of what people are wearing or the respect for their clients and for their work. But equally, I have a very creative team. They're not boring lawyers. Um, you know, we, we, we think we're providing something special, we're being creative. And so I want them to be their own individual selves and express themselves in the way that, that brings that to work. It's one of our core values, bring your personality to work. We don't want people to be gray. We want people to bring themselves and we hire people that, you know, we're happy to have do that. Um, you, you, you mentioned party wear just then, I think. And I believe you have said that people might dress the way they would if they were going to Annabelle's, a nightclub in London. I, I don't go there very much. I haven't thought about how to dress. But I just wonder whether that's right. Do people not want to divide their day, particularly in the office, from their night? Don't they want to wear quite different things at Annabelle's from what they wear in your office? I certainly don't mean like going to the old Annabelle's and going clubbing in evening wear. I don't mean that. I mean like going to breakfast or lunch or tea at Annabelle's now when people are dressed beautifully, fabulously, but it's not clubbing wear and it's, you know, it's not um, improper day wear for something that you're doing as a professional. It's just more creative, more expressive. OK. Uh, oh, oh, what about your clients? Because, as I understand it, you're in the business of advising people on things like divorce. I mean, divorce is a, a messy, murky and sad business. I mean, do you really want your lawyer turning up dressed like Michael Portillo when, when you're dealing with such very sombre matters? Shouldn't sombre matters be reflected in sombre dress? Divorce isn't a funeral. Divorce is the beginning of a new chapter in someone's life. So what divorce is more than anything else is intensely personal. You need to be able to connect with your lawyer. You don't want somebody who's put up some sort of barrier and isn't being themselves with you. You want someone who can laugh with you, who can be upset when you're upset, who can share what you're going through and, and fight the fight with you, but also go on the journey with you. So you want a human being. And uh, that's the essence of what I'm trying to do. But, uh, but no, divorce, although it's painful and traumatic, it is the beginning of a new chapter. And the whole point is to make it something that ends up being positive for everyone. Uh, very good. The picture quality, I'm afraid, has not been the greatest as we've been talking to you. But Aisha Vardag, we have heard you loudly and clearly. Thank you very much for coming on GB News. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, we're in the middle of the uh, awards season. And as often, the announcement of the Oscar nominations has brought controversy. There are, for example, no female directors on the shortlist. And one British actor, Andrea Riseborough, has been nominated for a film to Leslie that hardly anyone has seen, having grossed only £22,000 on its release in October. Indeed, out of the 18 Best Picture nominees of the past two years, only Dune made any sizable money at the box office. Does that suggest that the Oscars set up to reward talent is now just a Hollywood echo chamber? Uh, Stephanie Tetchy is GB News's showbiz reporter and joins me now. Lovely Good to see you. Good morning, Michael. Andrea Riseborough, first of all, yeah. why should people be upset that this mm. British actor uh, mm -hmm. is, is on the list of nominations? Well, you know, all during awards season, Michael, we have things such as the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs, and when we see those nominations, it's quite a prediction of who is going to be up for an Oscar. And the reason why this has caused such a furore is because this film, to Leslie, has been under the radar, as you said rightly so, early bank 22,000, which is quite low for an Oscar profile movie. And also, what's happened behind the scenes is that they've had this big campaign where the director, Michael 
Wilson. He's enlisted all the support of his famous pals, including Charlize Theron, Kate Winslet, to get behind the film and support it. So it's very much been a campaign by social media, which seems to have ruffled quite a few feathers with the Oscars and the Academy, because usually they are the ones who are picking the films. And you know what, Michael, when it comes to a lot of indie films, they tend to get snubbed by the Oscars because they haven't got a big backing in terms of budgets. Like, if you look at Coda last year, it was an indie film, but they put £10 million into their Oscar campaign, so it wasn't surprised that they won the best picture, where with this film, it's, it's made hardly any money. It hasn't been a big talk about film, so there's a lot of controversy because you're breaking the mould of how the Academy likes to select its big films. OK, so two points here, perhaps. Mm -hmm. The first is the Oscars are meant to reward talent. They are. So if the greatest talent happens to have been exhibited in a film that not many people have seen, yeah. well, let's give the award to mm -hmm. the greatest talent. Second point, how can she and her pals possibly be criticised for campaigning mm -hmm. when, as we've just said, mm -hmm. uh, films that have the money, like Coda, yeah. put vast amounts of money into winning the Oscar? Well, that's the problem with awards, Michael, especially film awards. There's a lot of secret handshakes and it's a lot of industry, people with big power and big money who can put their big films out there. But in terms of indie films, they don't get their shine or their credibility. And what's happening now, why this has been so controversial, because now the Academy are actually going to be reviewing this nomination because they're saying that there's accusation of maybe there could have been direct solicitation to their members, actually. So what the Oscars are saying, they haven't really had much control on this. So they're going to be examining how this nomination actually came to be. But I think rightly, p power to them, because what's happened is changing the agenda of what film should be there. It's not always the box office smash that should be in the uh, category, and it isn't always the ones that you think you should. Sometimes you need a wild card. Um, but what's happened happened in its 95-year history of the Oscars, it's changing. There's been so much upheaval over the past few years, and it seems like what's happened, the Oscars has almost become a box ticking award show. And now what's happening, we actually need credible films out there. Are you one of that handful of people who's seen to Leslie? No, but I actually, I now want to see it. And that's the good thing about these kind of films that come out of nowhere, because, to be honest, we've all heard about the avatars, we've heard about Top Gun, but this film now, it's, it's generated interest in it, and that's what films should do. I think what's happened with the Oscars, they've lost their way in terms of respecting the art of film and the people who do it. It's become this big kind of hype thing where it's more about the showbiz and less about the art of film. You, you said that the, um, the Oscars were in danger of degenerating, degenerating into box ticking, and yeah. yet... There's controversy again this year about a lack of diversity. Tell me about that. Well, there is, because what's happened now with these nominations, especially with Two Leslie, with Andrea Riseborough coming through, there's been a lack of black female artists who and directors who've been um, recognised. So we had the powerful film The Woman King with Viola Davis, which done incredibly well in the box office. And then we also had Till, which was stars Daniela Deadweiler, which shows the brutal killing of Emmett Till and the story behind that. Both done really well, but they haven't been nominated for an Oscar. So we had this big furore in 20, 20, 2015 where it was all about Oscars, hashtag Oscars so white, because there was a lack of diversity and a lack of nominations from black actors and black actresses. And now there's an Oscars so white to hashtag, which is going around talking about the lack of black talent that have been nominated. But Michael, I'm, you know, while I'm, as a black person, I do understand the plight of it, it's about awards, it should be about talent and it should be about merit. And if they haven't been selected, for it. It doesn't mean that just because they're black, they should be in there. There's, there's always politics behind these things, as we've been discussing. But you know what? There is reflection of diversity, because we have Michelle Yeoh, who stars in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, and she's nominated for Best Actress, and she's done incredibly well with the BAFTA. She's got a nomination. She picked up an award at the Golden Globes, and she's the first, second Asian actress to have been nominated for an Oscar since 1935. So you can imagine we've still got some way to go. So, <clears throat> a lack of black nominees, but yeah. Asian nominees. Yes, there. yeah. Uh, uh, that, and, and, and you're fairly content with that situation. Yeah. Um, I, it is difficult to know, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, if the Oscars do have uh, black mm -hmm. representatives, then they're accused of box ticking. Yeah. And if they don't, they're yeah. accused of a lack of diversity. I guess it's quite difficult. Should we care at all? Are mm -hmm. the Oscars losing their 
their credibility, their importance, their validity? I think they are, because we're living in a very oversaturated market with social media, <laughs> streaming services. There's so many services which are fighting for viewers' attention. And the Oscars used to be quite... Um, exclusive and elite in a time where there wasn't this access to celebrities and stuff. And now it feels like it's all about the scandals of the Oscars, such as last year when we saw Will Smith slap Chris Rock. It wasn't about the film. It was all about that slap. So what's happening now? People are more concerned with the drama and the controversy surrounding awards by, instead of the wards themselves. So I do feel like it's losing its relevancy. But as an establishment, you can't get rid of the Oscars. It's always going to be a staple on the showbiz calendar. But I think in time, it's going to be looking very different because, you know, as we've seen with the Brits Awards and they've scrapped gendered awards and all that kind of stuff, we're very much living in a very much transitional time of how arts and culture and film is being represented and what is being politically correct. The viewing figures for the ceremony mm -hmm. uh, have gone down dramatically. They have, because, as I said, we've got so many outlets which are vying for our attention. Most people are switching away from linear television onto streaming onto Netflix or Apple or just so many things online. And, as well, the Oscars come in the middle of the night, you know, internationally. If you're, if you're not a big fan, you're not going to stay up for it. You just want to know about the big headlines. And it seems like it's more an uh, industry thing. And this is why there's always a big kerfuffle about the awards, <laughs> because you're not actually reflecting what, what the public are viewing, because we're watching stuff like Avatar, Top Gun, all those box office smash hits, and they're not being really represented at these awards. It's all these under titles which we haven't heard about. So I think that's why there's this big disconnect with audiences and the Oscars. As someone who makes television programmes, one of yeah. the things that drives me mad is at the end of the television <laughs> programme you have credits, and yeah. now the tendency is to squeeze the credits over to one side, yeah. side of the screen where they can't be read yeah. and to be announcing the next programme and so on. And I think that's such a disrespect to the person who's done the sound and the lighting and so yeah. on. This happens at the Oscars now, isn't it? Because the people at the tail end, mm -hmm. all those technical yeah. awards, yeah. they're getting sort of cut off at the end, aren't they? We do. They are, because last <clears> year we saw them get rid of eight technical categories in favour of a top movie moment because they wanted Twitter users to vote who was the best movie moment of 2022. And it's sad because, you know, when it comes to making a film like as with a television <clears throat> show, you've got a big production team who make it and they deserve their credit and they deserve to be honoured. So in a sense now, it's becoming about making it more scan like more salacious and who's, you know, the best celebrity. But no, that's not what the industry is about. I think what's happened is that the Oscars have lost a lot of respect for people who are actually a big part of the industry. Yeah, here, here. Mm. Um, so in 1920, in yeah. 2021 and yeah. 2022, <laughs> yeah. there was a lack of nominations for big box office pictures. Yeah. But that isn't true this year, 2023, mm -hmm. because we've got Top Gun there and yep. we've got Elvis there. Yeah, we do. And we've got the... Banshees the Banshees of, of Inner Sheeran as well. And Sheeran. Like, all all yeah, of which are done well. Yeah, but what I tend to find on the night is that you always get those wild cards who tend to pick up awards because now who's got the most awards is The Quiet on the Western Front, which is a German war drama. And it's not even in English and it's in German. And it's managed to pick up so many nominations, both at the Golden Globes, at the BAFTAs and now the Oscars. So on the night, we'll be surprised. Fans tend to connect with those box office his hits like the Top Guns, but then these new films are the ones that actually end up winning on the night. All Quiet on the Western Front was originally a, a German book. I think it was yeah. published around the year 1930. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the reasons why we tend to view uh, the, the Great War in the way we do today. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting um, film. And mm. uh, Elvis. Now we're looking at a bit of uh, uh, Elvis. Elvis, yes. Fantastic performance. I, again, but Michael, it didn't do that well in the box office as people had hoped it will. Obviously, it's been very spoken about, and obviously, following Lisa Marie Presley's death, it's again back in the public periphery. But on the night, you'll be surprised whether it does pick up awards. But, you know, when we see stuff such as the Golden Globes, where Austin Butler did pick up Best Male Actor, it sometimes gives a hint of what we might see on the Oscars. And briefly, a word about Tom Cruise. Um, I, thought, <laughs> I, thought the new, I thought the new Top Gun was sensational. It was fabulous. I saw it at the IMAX. It's Amazing. 
Incredible, you know, and that's the thing. As a film viewer, you will say it's excellent, but I find that all the big blockbusters, they never do well on the night because, again, the Academy are looking for who's going to be most spoken about, and Tom Cruise has had his moment with this. And on the night, you know, you'll get that wild card who will pick up all of the nominations, which then will get the public to go view these films. And, of course, one of the things that Top Gun probably will would get the awards for yeah. is the technical side, which is absolutely stunning. And, obviously, that will go under the radar. And then you have stuff like such as Black Panther, the second follow-up as well. Again, it's up for five nominations, but on the night, I guarantee you, it'll probably only just pick up technical awards so they won't get that moment such as when you're winning the Best Actor or Best Actress. And you will be part of the dwindling audience watching uh, the Oscars, will I you? will, will you? be. I, you have to. It's almost like a showbiz rite of passage to watch the Oscars. You know, it's one of those awards you love to hate it, but it's what we've got. But the BAFTAs is the first thing, and that's what I'm quite excited about, British film and British talent getting their due. And, and Andrew Riseborough is British, so we're excited yeah, about her. Yeah, to be honest, Michael, I really do hope that they don't strip this nomination from her. We'll find out about that on Tuesday, because I feel like she's put in the work and they've rebelled against Hollywood, and this is what's interesting about this story. It's not just... They had hardly any money to make this film, so I think they're going against the grain and they should be awarded for that. Now there's a drum roll for what's going to happen at the Oscars. Uh, thank you very much to Stephanie Tecci. Coming up, the Doomsday Clock edges closer to midnight. Does the threat of humanity's extinction help to focus the mind and whiskey galore, but not from where you'd expect it? That's all after the weather. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Hope your weekend has been going all right. As we bring it to a close, there are two cold fronts across the UK. This one in the far south is a fairly weak feature, just bringing some patchy outbreaks of rain to southern Wales and southern areas of England. This one in the north, pushing into Scotland's Northern Ireland, has a bit more substance to it, so there are some longer spells of rain as it continues southwards into the evening, but that too will tend to fizzle out later on in the night. Behind that, we will see some clearer intervals develop, but also showers pushing in for Scotland. These will be heavy in places with hail, snow, down to around 400 metres over the mountains as well. A fairly brisk night for all of us with the wind, so frost is not too much of a worry as a result of that. Townsend City is around 5, 4 degrees Celsius, but perhaps down a bit lower than that in some sheltered areas. Otherwise, once we move into the start of Monday, a lot of sunshine to be had for many of us. There will be a bit of cloud lingering in the far southwest to begin with, and the breeze just will remain a bit strong in the northeast as well, but not too bad of a start to the new working week. Temperatures will be around 9, maybe 10 degrees across southern areas of England, but it will be noticeably cooler tomorrow than today across parts of Scotland. During the afternoon and into the evening, we'll then see the cloud pushing across Northern Ireland and then later into Scotland as well, further outbreaks of rain coming through here. And Monday night is relatively a repeat pattern of Sunday night where we see that next band of rain pushing southwards again, fading out and turning patchier as it eventually moves across areas of Wales and into central southern England with showers, blustery showers, following behind for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. That cold front will continue to push its way southwards into Tuesday, but behind that we get another squeeze in the ice of ours, bringing some fairly strong winds to Scotland as we move overnight to Tuesday and into Wednesday. So there is a yellow warning in force for that. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon and welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Michael Portillo, bringing you good conversation, arts and entertainment, ethical dilemmas and a sense of the ridiculous too. Last week brought Holocaust Remembrance Day, also the anniversary of Adolf Hitler's first open reference in the Reichstag to the annihilation of Jewish people. We look back at the Holocaust and how Germans, not persecuted by the Nazis, reacted. The doomsday clock has moved closer to midnight. We may be nearer to a nuclear weapons disaster than ever. Does that focus our minds or terrify us for no purpose? It's six decades since the spy Kim Philby defected to the Soviet Union. Is the impact of his betrayal still being felt? And we round off this Sunday with a wee dram of British whiskey. That's all after the news with Bethany Elsie. Michael, thank you. Good morning. It's one minute past 12. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Nadim Zahawi has been sacked from government after an ethics inquiry found a serious breach of the ministerial code. The former Tory party chair faced questions over his tax affairs after admitting he paid a penalty to HMRC for an error linked to his shares in the polling company YouGov. In a letter, Mr Zahawi assured the Prime Minister he'll continue to support the government from the backbenchers in coming years. MP Jacob Rees-Mogg says he has sympathy for him. The report seems to show that he made some technical errors with his declarations under the ministerial code uh, and the Prime Minister has decided that they were serious enough to um, fire him. So I feel sorry for Nadim Zahawi, uh, but I think that after it dominating the headlines for a week, the rule of politics is that if you do that, it's very hard to remain in office. The Housing Secretary has admitted that faulty government guidance allowed the Grenfell Tower tragedy to happen. Michael Gove says the whole system of building safety wasn't policed effectively enough. He's expected to announce a six-week deadline for developers tomorrow, forcing them to sign a contract to either fix their unsafe homes or be banned from building new ones. The fire at the residential tower block in West London killed 72 people in 2017. Boris Johnson was reportedly told to stop asking Richard Sharp for advice about his personal financial matters just two weeks before he was announced as the new chair of the BBC. According to the Sunday Times, Mr Johnson, who was Prime Minister at the time, was warned by officials to stop discussions in December 2020. Mr Sharp, a former banker, is facing calls to resign after it emerged he introduced the former PM to a guarantor for a loan. The government will publish an urgent emergency care plan tomorrow to try and tackle pressures on the NHS. It comes as the health department have announced plans to build virtual beds, caring for tens of thousands of elderly and vulnerable people at home. The health secretary admitted there was no quick fix, but said this immediate action to shift care away from hospitals will reduce waiting times. The former Conservative advisor, Claire Purcell, told GB News she's concerned about whether some health problems might be missed. With elderly people, 
if they have had a, a fall or they're not feeling very well, to then have the added bonus of technology on top of it mm -hmm. that they may not have access to, they may not be confident with, and also may not have Wi-Fi links at home. Not all older people do. The majority are, quite, are very, very good, but some won't. And I do worry that that personal contact, things are going to be missed. Dame Esther Ranson has announced she's been diagnosed with lung cancer, but said she's remaining optimistic. The 82-year-old was admitted, has admitted it was difficult keeping her diagnosis a secret and that she wanted to share the news in her own words. Last year, the broadcaster received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Women of the Year Awards. She was made a DBE in 2015 for her services to children and older people through the charities Childline and The Silver Line. In the US, the specialised police unit that included the five Memphis officers charged with the murder of Tyree Nichols have been permanently disbanded. It comes as protests continued across several cities after police body cam video was released showing the officers beating the 29-year-old. He died three days later. In a phone call, the Nichols family and their lawyer have urged President Joe Biden to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which was introduced in federal forces last year, to local police. As Ben will tell you, Mom and Dad, I couldn't get that passed. But what I did do by executive order, I made sure every federal agent, every federal agent mm -hmm. has to abide by mm -hmm. that act. Mm -hmm. and so, well, that's but, a start. Uh, we got to get it for local police. The head of the Welsh Rugby Union has resigned amid allegations of a toxic culture within the governing body. Steve Phillips' decision comes after the WRU announced an external task force will investigate claims of misogyny, sexism, racism and homophobia within the institution. Former Wales winger Nigel Walker has become acting CEO and has warned of an existential crisis for Welsh rugby ahead of the Six Nations. And we'll end with some breaking news. In the last few minutes, a 16-year-old boy has been charged with murder over the stabbing of 15-year-old Holly Newton in Hexham. We'll bring you more shortly. You're up to date on GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Michael. Uh, thank you, Bethany. In January 1939, German Chancellor Adolf Hitler told the Reichstag for the first time that the Nazis intended to exploit war to annihilate Jewish people. The murder of six million Jews was commemorated on Friday, which was Holocaust Memorial Day. The focus this year was on normal people, the victims of genocide, the normal people who were witnesses and bystanders to genocide, and the normal people who became its perpetrators. I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Sentry, Deputy Chief Executive of Holocaust Memorial Day Foundation, Holocaust survivor, Dr. Martin Stern, and author of A Village in the Third Reich, Julia Boyd. Um, Martin, um, you must be very aware of the perpetration of the Holocaust by ordinary people and the bystanders and the witnesses who were ordinary people did you therefore approve of the focus this year on ordinary people? I not only approved of it, I suggested it. Uh, there is a mass of evidence uh, from people who have studied the Holocaust that the mass murderers started out as ordinary people. Uh, ordinary policemen were taken off the street in Nazi Germany and sent to Poland to murder thousands and tens of thousands and some of them went back into the police force as ordinary policemen afterwards. Hmm. From that and a lot of other sources, we are intensely aware of this. And we want to get away from the idea of teaching history as a black and white issue of extremes. Because without the people in between, the Nazis would have been powerless. Yes, and how has that made you reflect on your, your fellow human beings? I mean, have you, have you lived your life since being a Holocaust survivor thinking that the people around you now, the people who surround you in Britain, could be caught up in such events were history to take 
that sort of turn? The answer has to be yes. There is an extraordinary upsurge in anti-Semitism, uh, all kinds of hatred, and not only against Jews, other kinds of polarization and hatred are on the rise around the world, including Britain. And people in Germany lived through what seemed to be a democracy, but it collapsed like a soap bubble. Hmm. So the veneer of civilization is, is, is very, very thin, would be your analysis, I suppose. And any of us might be swept up in such a thing were the circumstances to present themselves. The frightening thing uh, is that, indeed, uh, very ordinary people uh, get drawn into it. I mean, we're using this year a graphic novel uh, by a German graphic novelist. It is called Irmina. And it is about a young German woman who goes to London to improve her English and uh, learn typing, and she, at a party, meets a black man who is being treated insultingly. She leaps to his defense. She is a better than average person. She goes back to Germany. Her husband turns out in, uh, to be in the SS. She doesn't ask too many questions. When shops are being smashed and synagogues burnt, she doesn't ask too many questions, and in fact, she parrots the Nazi slogans to her little son. And after the war, she goes back to being a normal person and, in fact, meets this uh, black student she met in the 1930s, and they have a conversation. It is exactly about ordinary people and how nuanced and subtle the reactions are. But without those, Nazism could not have occurred. Um, Rachel, tell me why it is important still to have Holocaust Memorial Day once a year. It is so important for us all to remember the six million men, women and children who were murdered simply because they were Jewish, as well as the thousands, millions of other people murdered by the Nazis for all different reasons, just because the Nazis didn't like them or want them. But on Holocaust Memorial Day, we also remember the other genocides that have taken place in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur, all examples of people being targeted, persecuted just because of an aspect of their identity. And we know that there are places around the world today that are still at risk. One of the advantages of the theme, ordinary people, is that we are all ordinary people and we all have choices to make today. We know that thousands of people all around the country came together on Holocaust Memorial Day, which was on Friday. They lit candles, placed them in their window at 4 p.m. to create a national moment to light up the darkness so that we remember what happened, remember all the people that were murdered, and stand up against racism, anti-Semitism and, and identity-based hatred today. I didn't know that Holocaust Memorial Day also applied to these other genocides, and I personally am delighted to hear that, because I could see otherwise that the criticism would be, you know, why, why focus on one genocide and uh, not the others? So, so that is um, excellent news. Um, how important, how widespread, Rachel, is Holocaust denial at the moment? Unfortunately, Holocaust denial is very much on the increase, not only denial, but also trivialisation. Um, Social media platforms make it very easy for people to post anonymously and also fake news. It's quite difficult for people to fact check. They sometimes share information without checking it. And that's why it's so important that we listen to survivors like Martin while they are still with us and hear their, their testimony from their mouths, their own words, and that we learn from them and remember it so that we can stand up against identity-based hatred, against racism, against anti-Semitism. What does polling tell us about how widespread Holocaust denial is now? Do we, do we know how many people simply disbelieve? I think the there Holocaust? was a Dutch poll that I happened that. recently. I thought um, it showed a quarter of some age group as being. Do, do you know the statistics? Millennials, uh, millennials. Uh, something like 38% uh, uh, didn't know how many people had died in the Holocaust, even remotely. A quarter of uh, young people below about the age of 30 uh, thought the Holocaust had not occurred. And uh, there was a whole list of statistics, a bit complicated to remember, but it was in the Times, yes. And, and deeply shocking. Now, uh, Julia Boyd. 
Uh, let's um, for a moment talk about your book, A Village in the Third Reich. What was it you did in that book? Well, I did exactly what Martin's been talking about. I, at least I tried to present a more nuanced picture uh, than the one that I grew up with, which was, you know, basically just monsters and heroes, and there was nothing in between. And uh, the village proved to be a very good study for this. At first, I was worried that because it's right down on the Austrian border, it was too far away from the centre of action to, to, to be meaningful. But there really wasn't a single aspect of the war that you couldn't look at through this small Bavarian village's perspective. And, of course, the village had uh, people across the whole spectrum. At one end, there were dedicated Nazis who remained so into the bitter end, um, and at the other end, people who hated the Nazis, and in the middle, people who might have started out as very enthusiastic Nazis, but when they saw the real colour of the regime change their minds. The trouble was uh, that you couldn't really change your mind. Uh, the, the, the grip of the Nazis was so intense their tentacles went into every last corner of German society. So if you woke up one morning and said, oh, I don't like the Nazis anymore, um, I'm going to protest, you'd have ended up in Dachau. And even if you were very brave, what about your family who would have been left destitute? So it is a more nuanced picture, as I say, than the one that I grew up with. And I think looking at one village, uh, certainly it's helped me um, to understand better the inconsistencies that Martin was talking about just now. You know, you can do a good thing one day and then do a terrible thing the next. It's just all so complicated. But Ter that, of course, doesn't take a carry from the total evil of the Nazi regime. Sorry. No, not at all. But, for example, tell me a little bit about the mayor. There, there was a mayor of the village. Well, take it up from there. Well, Ludwig Fink is a very good example of, um, of a person who started out very enthusiastic about the Nazis, partly because... Germans were so humiliated after the First World War and with the Treaty of Versailles. And long comes Hitler, who says he's going to put Germany back at the top table of nations. And many people were seduced by this. But Ludwig Fink, who was the mayor of Oberstdorf, was basically a decent human being. And after a while, he saw that Hitler was not going to calm down as many people had thought once he got into power. And um, he couldn't really protest. A senior Nazi, he was in a senior position as mayor, uh, he simply would have been sent to Dachau or killed. Um, so he did his best to mitigate the evil uh, as much as he could. He protected the Jews. There were very few, but the few Jews living in Oberstdorf. He protected the nuns. He did what he could to protect people from the worst um, excesses of, of, of the Nazis. And, of course, um, ordinary people suffered, even if, in terms of the Holocaust, they were simply bystanders and witnesses. But from that village, uh, many of the young men, of course, died. Yes. And, you know, the big question is, how much did ordinary Germans really know? And even in Little Oberstdorf, right down on the Austrian border, 100 miles away from the nearest big city, Munich, people knew, I'm sure of it. For a start, the young men were coming back uh, on leave. And although they wouldn't have been able to talk out publicly, they must have talked to their friends and their family about the terrible atrocities they'd witnessed on the East Front and possibly taken part in themselves. Um, just 10 miles north of Zontofen, there was uh, this Ordensburg, this Nazi-type castle, where people like Himmler came to brief Nazis in the area. And he certainly was there in '44, briefing uh, Nazis on the final solution. Um, it's impossible to think that details of what he said then didn't leak out into, into Zontofen and to Oberstdorf and the surrounding area. There were camps all round Oberstdorf. There, were, there, were, there was a Waffen-SS training camp, which was run by prisoners uh, taken from Dachau. There were labour camps. There were these sub-camps of the concentration camps. Did, so everybody knew what was going on. Difficult to be in ignorance. And, and, and quite briefly, tell me about the investigation at the end of the war when they come into the village and want to know how much of a Nazi you've been. Very difficult to sort that one out. I mean, were you a Nazi? It's exactly like the, the lady that um, Martin was talking about. Were you a Nazi if you made Nazi... If the headmaster, for instance, made robust Nazi speeches in the school, but he protected the Jewish children in the class. He wore an, SS, an SA uniform, but he tried hard to keep a sense of humanity in his school. Um, it's a very mixed picture. Of course, there were the out-and-out -out Nazis, and too many of them 
uh, were let out. But there were people who, as I say, a, a part of this slightly inconclusive mix in the middle. One day they were a Nazi, the next day they were behaving like decent people. Martin, what's your reaction to that picture that Julia paints of a particular village, probably quite typical of what was going on in Nazi Germany? Well, uh, in immediate post-war Germany, as a German citizen who had been involved in Nazism, you could go to the town hall and get a Persilschein, mm. a Persil certificate. The advertising slogan for Persil washing powder was Persil washes whiter. Mm. You and could, so you could the, clear your name. Yes, and these people entered normal life and uh, administrative and uh, government roles, yes. I don't know how many um, Holocaust Memorial Day commemorations you've been involved in, but was this one for you special in some way, Martin? Very special indeed. It's a turning point. The turning point is from the talking about the extremes and leaving uh, an impression of something that is either completely black or completely white to uh, an approach which provokes questions about everybody. Yeah. Well, this has been a very nuanced uh, discussion and an absolutely fascinating one. Um, Dr Rachel Sentry, Dr Martin Stern, Julia Boyd, thank you very much to all of you. Um, coming up, the doomsday clock ticks ever closer to midnight. Are we really 90 seconds away from doom due to nuclear weapons? That's coming up after the break. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, I, I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Uh, this week, the so-called doomsday clock moved closer to midnight than it has ever been. A panel of scientists and Nobel laureates, collectively known as the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, created the clock in 1947 to highlight the danger that humankind could be destroyed by the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Well, the clock is now warning that we are at the moment of greatest risk following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In the late 1940s, the doomsday clock was initially set at three minutes to midnight. The supposed end of the Cold War in 1991 lessened the nuclear threat, taking us back to 17 minutes to midnight. But since the mid-2000s, the clock has been moving steadily forward, 
and as of this week, it now stands at 90 seconds to midnight. Well, the clock was designed to focus world leaders on avoiding catastrophe. Does creating fear spur people to action or merely to feeling helpless? Professor Frank Ferradi is a sociologist and social commentator who studies the sociology of fear, and he joins me now. Frank, it's very good to talk to you. Welcome to GB News. Um, do you have a view? Do you have a view as to whether the clock is in the right place? In other words, do you think that the danger has uh, grown in recent years? I think there is a, a, a certainly a lot of danger, not necessarily of nuclear war, but of conflict. We, we see a lot of uh, regional tensions emerging. Uh, and for example, people are focused on Ukraine and Russia, but on the eastern borders of, Ukraine, of Russia, there are conflicts with Kazakhstan, there is conflict between Tajikistan and surrounding nations, Azerbaijan and Armenia. So we are living in a world that is uh, prone to conflict and there isn't uh, any kind of uh, global mechanism for limiting these kind of conflicts from erupting and becoming far more dangerous. I think that's what we should be concentrating on rather than this continuous fantasy of nuclear war, which has been an obsession of these scientists since 1947. Uh, and if you simply are worried about uh, the end of the world, what you're doing is almost creating this kind of quasi alarmist, uh, religious kind of, the world is coming to an end kind of scenario, which basically distracts people from facing the real problems. And that's why I don't particularly find this metaphor of a ticking time bomb or, a, or of, of this doomsday clock particularly persuasive. Uh, on the one hand, as you say, it's focused on nuclear war, which uh, might be the wrong sort of focus to have. As you say, maybe you should think about conflict in a broader way. But has it also, to some extent, been, as it were, adulterated because it now contains elements of, you know, climate catastrophe and things like that? Well, it has. You have to remember that in the last 25, 30 years, the number of what they call existential crises has increased. So we're told that, uh, you know, we're going to blink our eyes and it's going to be the end of the planet. We're told that we have a, a demographic time bomb as well, that we're going to be overtaken by far too many humans. So we have a you know, water shortage is going to create a major problem, a catastrophe for us. When you look at the number of projected catastrophes, there's quite a lot of them. And it's become almost a, a kind of pro forma way of making claims about the future, uh, basically saying that unless you do something, the world's going to come to an end. And I think that kind of uh, alarmist uh, scenarios that are being created create the impression uh, of helplessness, either of helplessness or of disinterestedness. Because if oh. you heard these uh, claims before, you're, you're just going to switch off. Well, you see, that's, that's what's interesting, because, you know, here is the clock apparently closer to doomsday than we've ever been. And yet, let's face it, we're not very worried about it uh, uh, as a whole. I mean, you know, it's not part of today's news bulletin, is it? We're focused on uh, the resignation of a government minister here in the United Kingdom. So whatever the doomsday clock is saying, it's not what people as a whole are feeling. You're right. Uh, not, not in relation to nuclear war. A lot of young people have been become addicted to this climate catastrophism. And when you talk to 12, 13-year-olds, a lot of them actually believe that this is a clear and present danger. And I think that's a problem because it basically means that young people are growing up, instead of thinking about their own future, what they can do to make things happen, are fixed on this possibility, which then becomes an excuse for not doing a lot of things. Because if it's going to happen so soon, well, what's the point of trying? What's the point of doing uh, sort of stuff in your life that's going to make a real difference? So it's very, very unhelpful. But I think you're right. I, I was involved in an EU project five years ago where we looked at every single fear that's around, every kind of alarmist fears, and we found that none of the high-profile media fears like global terrorism or, uh, or, or global uh, climate change, none of those things were top of the list. What people were really worried about, old age pension, they were worried about uh, having a, a good economic life, they were worried about whether their children was going to have a job or not. So they were these mundane fears of everyday life that actually preoccupy people rather than what you see in the headlines. You talked about the damage to young people of fearing catastrophe and therefore, as it were, giving up on their 
on their lives. Would you accuse some people of weaponizing catastrophe theory? Are there some people with an agenda who push the idea of catastrophe? I think so. I think a lot of the, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of the uh, climate activists take the view that if you scare people uh, enough, they're going to do something. And they believe that if you are scare society, you're going to get it, they're going to get attention. And basically, they're real attention seekers. And therefore, when you basically indicate that there's going to be a major problem very, very soon, that the world's going to come to an end unless we do something, you kind of they hope to create a kind of uh, anxiety, a sense of anxiety, which will motivate people to join their forces. So it's not just simply weaponizing catastrophism, it's turning that into an ideology where it becomes this ideology of doom, uh, where you create this kind of zeitgeist of pessimism as a result of that. And that's something that at least a section of society uh, thrives on. They think this is the way forward. The ideology of doom and the zeitgeist of pessimism. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank, Frank Ferreira. Um, coming up, it's 60 years since the spy Kim Philby disappeared, defecting to the Soviet Union. Do we still have spies amongst friends? Coming up after the news headlines, which are read by Bethany Elsie. Good afternoon, it's half past 12. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom. Nadim Zahawi has been sacked from the government after an ethics inquiry found a serious breach of the ministerial code. The former Tory party chair faced questions over his tax affairs after admitting he paid a penalty to HMRC for an error linked to his shares in the polling company YouGov. In a letter, Mr Zahawi assured the Prime Minister he'll continue to support the government from the backbenchers in the coming years. A 16-year-old boy has been charged with the murder of 15-year-old Holly Newton, who was fatally stabbed in Hexham on Friday. Northumbria Police says Holly was taken to hospital, where she later died. A 15-year-old boy was also injured in the attack. He remains in hospital, but is in a stable condition. The suspect, who can't be named for legal reasons, is due to appear at Newcastle Magistrates Court tomorrow. The Housing Secretary has admitted that faulty government guidance allowed the Grenfell Tower tragedy to happen. Michael Gove says the whole system of building safety wasn't policed effectively enough. He's expected to announce a six-week deadline for developers tomorrow, forcing them to sign a contract to either fix their unsafe homes or be banned from building new ones. The fire at the residential tower block in West London killed 72 people in 2017. The government will publish an urgent emergency care plan tomorrow to try and tackle pressures on the NHS. It comes as the health department have announced plans to build virtual beds, caring for tens of thousands of elderly and vulnerable people at home. The health secretary admitted there was no quick fix, but this immediate action would reduce waiting times. And Dame Esther Ranson has announced she's been diagnosed with lung cancer, but said she's remaining optimistic. The 82-year-old admit, admitted it was difficult keeping her diagnosis a secret and that she wanted to share the news in her own words. She was made a DBE in 2015 for her services to children and elderly people through the charities Childline and The Silver Line. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now it's back to Michael. Thank you, Bethany. It's 60 years since Kim Philby disappeared in Beirut to resurface in Moscow. He was part of the notorious spy ring that originated in Cambridge University, which penetrated the upper reaches of the British establishment and passed valuable information to the Soviet Union. Others included in the ringing were Donald McLean, Guy Burgess and Anthony Blunt. Philby worked as a double agent during the Second World War and into the 1950s. The treason of this group and others destroyed the trust of the United States in UK intelligence. Calder Walton is an author and historian of intelligence and global security at Harvard University and joins me now. He has a new book called Spies that tells the story of the intelligence war between Russia and the West with lessons for our new superpower conflict with China. 
You're very welcome to GB News. Let's, let's do some history first. Sounds good to me. We sometimes talk about the Cambridge Four and then we talk about the Cambridge Five. Uh, I've heard people say it may have been the Cambridge Ten. Have you any idea how many spies there were linked in that organisation? Well, the first thing to say is that the Soviet intelligence services definitely um, employed a, a wide net in terms of recruitment at both Cambridge and Oxford, we have to say, as well. Um, the Cambridge Five that have gone down in history as sort of the, the worst uh, traitors in British, modern British history, they were the five best of those recruits. But you're absolutely right, Michael, that the, um, they were not the only ones. There were undoubtedly, we know, um, other agents who were recruited but didn't make it to the, the apex of the intelligence community like the Cambridge Five did. And in case people might think that this was sort of glamorous or exciting, do you want to say something about the damage that they did and the lives that they cost? It, it, absolutely profound damage. Uh, damage within the services themselves of uh, betraying colleagues and friends. Damage between relations between Britain and the United States and other allies. It took the best part of 30 years for Britain's intelligence services to actually track down uh, the five members of the Cambridge spy ring. Uh, and in the process, um, Britain's intelligence services um, tore themselves apart looking for internal moles at one point um, accusing MI5's director general of being a Soviet spy. Roger, Was that Roger Hollis? Roger Hollis, indeed. Mm -hmm. The corrosive, destructive um, um, effect that this has on intelligence services, not only in Britain, but also in, in the US, Kim Philby's good friend in the CIA, James Angleton, was the head of the CIA's counterintelligence in the 1960s. When Philby, 60 years ago this month, defected, this was a bombshell for James Angleton and his staff of um, mole hunters within the CIA ground to a halt. He started turning away genuine defectors, thinking that they were plants. Michael, this is the so-called wilderness of mirrors um, uh, where it's difficult to tell what's going on. So I, it's, I don't think you mentioned the agents that were uh, rubbed out that's uh, right. because they had been revealed by Philby and by the others. And some of these people would have been, uh, as far as they knew, friends of Philby and Burgess and McLean and Blunt and Cairncross. Absolutely. Uh, bra and also brave agents um, who MI6 and the CIA parachuted in, in behind the Iron Curtain um, who uh, uh, Philby portrayed in his KGB-sponsored memoirs that he wrote after he got to Moscow. He sort of, uh, he, he said, writes to the effect, I don't really know what happened to these agents who I betrayed in Eastern Europe, but I can make a good guess. I mean, that's the kind of uh, treachery that we're talking about. What about the other way around? Uh, the British did have some successes in penetrating the KGB. That's right, indeed. And actually, the riddle of the Cambridge spies um, who was the so-called missing fifth man, this had been sort of a, the search for the fifth man for, for years, was only really solved when MI6 recruited um, a high-level agent inside the KGB. This was Oleg Gordievsky, who was recruited by Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service in the 1970s and then um, managed to become, uh, rather amazingly, the KGB head of station resident in London in the 19, uh, early 1980s, all the while providing intelligence to MI6 and to Margaret Thatcher as she was negotiating with the Soviet Union. Yes, I'm going to make a link back to the last item because one of the things that Gordievsky was able to tell Margaret Thatcher mm. was that the Soviet Union really thought that a NATO exercise was a, a veil for launching a preemptive nuclear attack, that the Soviets were genuinely worried that they were going to be attacked by NATO and were therefore preparing either for a retaliation or for a preemptive first strike. So that intelligence from Gordievsky was actually crucial, possibly to saving us from nuclear disaster. That's absolutely right. Um, and you can see in Reagan's diary, when he um, was briefed on intelligence by MI6, going to the CIA and then to the White House, he writes in his diary, it turns out that the Soviets are actually genuinely afraid of us. I don't know why, but they are. So there we are. It, you have to understand it's about sort of strategic empathy. And for, you, can, you can then see it in Reagan's foreign policy, where he suddenly he goes from talking about the evil empire to then actually being alerted and saying, they are genuinely afraid of you. And if you keep banging this drum, it's only going to make matters worse. And what does he do? He tones down the rhetoric. Mm. And that's the beginning of a, 
of a Reagan detente, if you like, with Gorbachev, um, which then ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Lots of books have been written about spies. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering why you've written another one. What another have, one. What, what, <laughs> have you, what have you brought to the table? Well, um, the, ex the exciting thing is about studying this subject now is just the volume of records that are declassified. Um, and, Michael, I've actually seen your name uh, in the 1990s in Ministry of Defence uh, records that were released just last year. So this is uh, really, there's, there's too many records to work with for just mm. one person like myself. Mm. So what am I able to bring to the table? New records, new insights into operations and failures, but then also the, the, the broader context. And my book, in, in, in summary, says that for 100 years and counting, um, the West and Russia have been engaged in a clandestine war. And even when we think that, that um, uh, relations between East and West improve, they don't actually, and that but Russia in particular sees openings and detente and um, the easing of relations as a way to increase aggressive foreign intelligence. And of course, that's not surprising given the person that's in the, Krem in the Kremlin at the moment. But you've also got something to say about China. I do indeed. T tell us about China in the present day. Well, with all of the attention um, on Russia and Ukraine, obviously, uh, the, the true superpower um, between East and West is China. And Chinese intelligence services make the Soviet intelligence services and even Russian intelligence services today look childlike. They um, are throwing resources at intelligence collection in a way that um, is difficult to even comprehend. So my, my, at the end of my book, I, I argue that this story, a hundred year story, uh, between Russia and the West is a warning and a foretaste of what might be coming. And I would argue already is here, but we just haven't really got our heads around it with China at the moment in terms of aggressive intelligence collection, stealing um, science and technology, stealing key, key um, uh, as I said, s and uh, military, industrial and economic intelligence. In the case of China, there's been a lot of interest in Chinese gadgetry yeah. um, and whether, therefore, we have been implanted with devices in our mobile telephones, in our, yep. in our systems of, of, of all kinds. Um, is the balance between the, the, um, the spy and that sort of intelligence between, I suppose, humant and SIGINT yep. uh, changing? I think absolutely. I think that we are at a profound moment of change in terms of how we understand intelligence and national security. Um, the old-fashioned divisions between humant and SIGINT, as you just said, um, no longer really exist, that the, really the new form of intelligence um, for everyone across the world is open source uh, intelligence. And so traditional distinctions um, about um, running human spies, yes, there's always going to be a niche for a traditional human. There's still going to be a need for traditional SIGINT, but open source intelligence is the driver. Collecting data, processing that data from open sources, through artificial intelligence and machine learning. That is the intelligence present and future, I would say. And then, of course, there are all those, there are always people who are taken along innocently in cooperating with foreign powers. Uh, and maybe this brings us back to where we began, Cambridge University. Yep. Are, are you concerned about people who may naively be involved in some of these matters? following a Chinese agenda without knowing it. I think that's absolutely right. The KGB has a, had a, a long-standing term called useful idiots, um, unwitting people who didn't really know what they were doing, that were acting as mouthpieces. Um, and I think that the best um, antidote to that is if you actually look to what KGB defectors in the Cold War said about how, to inoc how Western societies can inoculate themselves against um, so-called active measures on the part of uh, Russia, covert action, propaganda, and that is, they said, read the news widely. Don't just trust one source. Um, try to acquaint yourself with stories that are in the news from different angles. And, and my lord, uh, Michael, I think we need that today more than, than ever uh, with social media. Well, I, I'm tempted to say I'm afraid that this is always a fascinating subject. I've found talking to you, uh, Calder Walton, extremely interesting. Thank you for being with us. And uh, the book Spies will be out in June. Uh, coming up, the whiskey business and why it can be stiff now where you would least expect it. Join me after the break.
This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back. Originally, it was made by monks and used for medical purposes, considered to be a cure for smallpox. Today, the global whiskey industry is worth approximately £100 billion, with the rarest bottles of malt selling for almost £2 million at auction. Some say that whiskey was invented in Ireland in 1757, but as we all know, it was taken up with enthusiasm by the Scots. And today, exports of whiskey from the United Kingdom amount to more than £8 billion a year. But where I am now, there are no Munros and no Glens. This is flat as a pancake Norfolk, where the spirit has brought me. Today, we're talking about English whiskey at the English Distillery and the English Whiskey Company. I imagine this cannot be a very old distillery because I don't associate England with whiskey. We started in 2005. My uh, farmer had a dream, having been a farmer all his life, to turn barley into something more useful, as he put it. <laughs> and finally, on his 60, 60th birthday, he was like, I, I really am going to open a distillery. And it was never going to be on this scale. It was going to be a smaller, a bit like sort of the microbreweries that were opening. But luckily, our HMRC said you can't open a small distillery back then. So we built this one. And uh, yeah, England's first registered whiskey distillery. And here we are 16, 17 years later. Had your family been on the land for a while? So we are 600 years, pretty much straight line going back. And still today, the vast majority of Nelstrops are either part of uh, the eastern side of the country uh, farming, or there's a grain mill operating near Manchester still one of the largest in the country, which is the other half of the family. So you have uh, barley, obviously. Do you have water as well? So this area of Norfolk is called Breckland, and it sits over the Breckland Aquifer, which is a fantastic source of cold, which is very important, uh, pure water. So we've got it grain, grain grown in East Anglia and water. Don't need anything else. So the distilling floor itself is where the barley is turned into alcohol. We start off by milling the grain, and that grain each morning is mixed with hot water into the mash tun. And what you end up with is like sloppy porridge. It goes into the fermenters where we add a bit of yeast. Quite quickly, over the course of 24 hours, it will turn all that sugary liquid into an alcoholic beer, basically. What we're left with after five days is a very flavoursome real ale, I suppose that is then taken to the first of the pair of stills. And the wash still takes that 5,000 litres of beer 
and it reduces it down to a clearish spirit and around 20% alcohol. So we take that white spirit and we put it in the second still, the spirit still. Once it starts distilling, we take a section in the middle, known as the cup or the heart of the whiskey. And that section in the middle becomes mature in whiskey. By law, whiskey has to go into oak, or, or rather a wooden cask, traditionally oak, for at least three years. This, I believe, is called the bonded warehouse, and we're surrounded by barrels. Uh, tell me a little bit about them. Most of our casks are what we call ASB, or American Standard Barrels. Um, the reason they are used all over the industry is in order to make bourbon, by law you've got to put it into a virgin cask, one that's never been used before. And bourbon doesn't take long to mature, quite often two to four years. So the moment they empty a cask, they can't reuse it. Huh. So the vast majority of whiskey is matured in ex-bourbon casks. They're, they're brilliant because they're very consistent in size. They give a very consistent flavour, which is what you want when you're creating a product that may take 50 years to, to do again. In Scotland, what happens in the cask is during the heat of the day, the liquid expands and it pushes the alcohol vapour out through the oak and at night it cools down and sucks in fresh air again. But it's not very warm in Scotland, as we all know, and so they lose about 2% a year through evaporation. It's called the angel's share. Here in Norfolk, where the sun always shines and it's an awful <laughs> lot warmer, apart from today where it's freezing, uh, we're, we're, our angel's share is actually about 5%, which is huge. The downside is, of course, we're losing more alcohol. The upside is we're maturing an awful lot faster. And you have very happy Norfolk angels who we are have very happy Norfolk angels. imbibing all of that. And so this is an example of transatlantic recycling. Exactly present. that, yes. And I have a feeling we can taste some whisky somewhere a bit warmer. We definitely can. Let's do that. Come on. Andrew, I think of this as being quite a small distillery, but what a range of products. How do you decide what to produce? Ultimately, we only produce two things. We, we produce a peated spirit and an unpeated. But then once it goes into casks, the world's your oyster. There, there are loads of different casks, as we discussed, and uh, each one creates something different. And of course, time as well. An eight-year-old tastes different to a ten-year-old. So, so a distillery like this has to be very clear about what its market is. You, you're, you're going for a niche, aren't you? I think you start off as a niche, because that's all you can do to start with. With whiskey, there are only a few bottles you made on day one, and therefore it, it is quite niche. You start off only for the, the whiskey enthusiasts, if you like. We go to whiskey shows, and you meet, they don't mind, whiskey anoraks. And that is the marketplace you start off with. I don't own an anorak, but do I qualify for a tasting? You're definitely are having a tasting. Well, these are our two core products. We've got our original, which is what it says, unpeated, and then we've got a smoky one. So we'll try the original first. So that's definitely our best seller. When my father first started, it was very clear in the business plan he did not want to make weird and wacky left field whiskey. He just wanted a really good single malt that he could share with mates. It's just a really lovely, easy drinking single malt. Mmm. Oh, it's incredibly soft and smooth. It is very easy drinking. It rolls around the tongue beautifully, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, what a lovely whiskey. Tell me about peat. I think I'm going to like it even more with peat. Fine. But where does the peat suddenly arrive from? When we ring our maltster, we order peated or plain malt. But they still do it the same way, and they're still burning a traditional peat fire, and that smoke goes through the barley, and it stays in the barley until it gets to us, and it then stays in the liquid all the way through the process. We have deliberately picked peats that give us more of a bonfire smoke, so it's smoke rather than peat which I think is more approachable to a lot of people. So, this is our smoky English whiskey. We'll have a, we'll have a taste. For Pete's sake. That this is delicious. That's the one for me. There you are. And what is extraordinary is both of those products, and both of those single malt whiskies, are made in the same way matured in the same casks and are the same age. And the only difference is the malting process and a bit of that peat smoke being blown over the barley. And they are, they're completely different, aren't they? Can English whiskey be as good as Scotch? Easily, yes, no reason it shouldn't. We are 
a distillery ultimately is just a series of equipment and skill sets and we all use malted barley and we all use water. So nothing about Scottish water, nothing about the cold weather in Scotland, none of those things gives them an advantage over you? No. All it does is mean that their whisky is unique to them and our whisky is unique to us. But we can all do the job very well. And just like you can make whisky in Sweden and France and Japan and Australia, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to make it in England, Wales and Scotland. I vote for some tea. Uh, thanks to uh, Andrew Nelstrop and everyone at the English Distillery Company. Well, Alistair Stewart is coming up next. Now, Nadine Sahawi, it seems to be, um, he got some sympathy earlier from Jacob Rees-Mogg, who yes. now works with GB News. But I don't feel so much sympathy because he jolly well should have told the Prime Minister that he had a skeleton in the cupboard. Well, I, I think the debate about what the Prime Minister did and didn't know, and I heard you talking about it on your programme a little earlier on, is intriguing. But what is not in doubt per adventure <laughs> is that Mr Zahawi knew uh, in precise detail because his, one of his defences is that he went to HMRC and said, look, this is a bit tricky and I may have made a bit of a slip up here, can we sort it out? Um, uh, and yet he accepted the chancellorship from Boris Johnson and then the chairmanship um, months ahead of an election uh, from, from, from Mr Sunak. And, and so what we're going to go down is the road of saying whether or not many of these people in public life, not only politicians, but also trade union leaders, have misplaced their moral compasses, including those who think it's right to shut schools down and deny children their education. I hope that during the course of your programme, Alistair, you will discover some moral compasses that have gone missing. Thanks to all my guests this week. Next week, we'll be talking about migration and net zero. And also, what does a food critic actually do? Thank you very much for watching today. I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Goodbye. Hello there. I'm Jonathan Vautry with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Hope your weekend has been going all right. As we bring it to a close, there are two cold fronts across the UK. This one in the far south is a fairly weak feature, just bringing some patchy outbreaks of rain to southern Wales and southern areas of England. This one in the north, pushing into Scotland's Northern Ireland, has a bit more substance to it so there are some longer spells of rain as it continues southwards into the evening but that too will tend to fizzle out later on in the night. Behind that we will see some clearer intervals develop but also showers pushing in for Scotland. These will be heavy in places with hail snow down to around 400 metres over the mountains as well. A fairly brisk night for all of us with the wind, so frost is not too much of a worry as a result of that. Towns and cities around 5, 4 degrees Celsius but perhaps down a bit lower than that in some sheltered areas. Otherwise, once we move into the start of Monday, a lot of sunshine to be had for many of us. There will be a bit of cloud lingering in the far southwest to begin with, and the breeze just will remain a bit strong in the northeast as well, but not too bad of a start to the new working week. Temperatures will be around 9, maybe 10 degrees across southern areas of England, but it will be noticeably cooler tomorrow than today across parts of Scotland. During the afternoon and into the evening, we'll then see the cloud pushing across Northern Ireland and then later into Scotland as well, further outbreaks of rain coming through here. And Monday night is relatively a repeat pattern of Sunday night where we see that next band of rain pushing southwards again, fading out and turning patchier as it eventually moves across areas of Wales and into central southern England with showers, blustery showers, following behind for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. That cold front will continue to push its way southwards into Tuesday, but behind that we get another squeeze in the ice of ours, bringing some fairly strong winds to Scotland as we move overnight to Tuesday and into Wednesday. So there is a yellow warning in force for that. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this Even morning. Even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Oh, you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8 p.m. Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Stuart, and for the next two hours, I'll be keeping you company on TV and radio with the stories that really matter across the country. We have plenty coming up, as always, including morality in politics. Do the people in power, not only in politics, but even...